Welcome, and thank you for joining us here at Commitment Online, a place for all nations. We want you to fully engage with us, so feel free to gather your family, invite a friend, or if you're alone, we trust that you'll have a wonderful worship experience with us today. Our worship service will begin in just a few minutes.
speak is the promise that you keep this firm foundation cannot be shaken yeah Hallelujah, I believe. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, this is an opportunity that we take. Uh, we choose the fourth Sunday of the month to do communion. And if you believe, you may join along with us as we do this. Is, and before I start, is there anyone here who does not have one of these? If you would raise your hand. And we have one over here, Kevin. Someone that doesn't have communion so we can all partake this morning. Um, I was thinking today that uh, this time when Christ delivered the communion message that we, are, we, we utilize here when we do communion and what he asked us to remember was that during the Last Supper and one of the, when I think of the Last Supper I always think that you know, it didn't really matter who was there it didn't matter what they had to eat 
this is what matters. It's the blood of Jesus. It's our only way to him. And love put Jesus on that cross. His love for us, his desire for us to be able to be with him made him go through that brutality and be nailed to the cross of Calvary to shed his blood so we don't have to. And then, of course, just to make things all better, he rose again the third day to provide us with our victory over the grave. As a history major and a guy that's interested in history, uh, I, I know a lot of people that were leaders and great people throughout history, but they're all dead, except for one, Jesus Christ. So that's why we do this. We don't ever, ever, ever want to forget the love that it took to save me and to save you. If you would stand with me, please. I'd like to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 23. It says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man, but a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So what I'd like to do right now before we do this, is everyone close your eyes and bow your heads and take this moment before God to seek forgiveness so that we can be pure before God. Father, I ask in the name of Jesus that you reveal to each one of us those secret sins, those things that we do, uh, maybe even that we're not even aware of, that you would reveal that to us so that we can ask for forgiveness and repent of these sins as we come before you now. We thank you for the love that it took to put Jesus on the cross and for the power that was given to us because Jesus rose from the dead. Thank you for that kind of love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may partake.
Jesus, because you are our King, our Lord of Lords, our King of Kings. Let's clap our hands as we sing this song together. Then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answering said to him, Permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he permitted him. Baptism is a believer's first act of obedience, just as Jesus himself was baptized before he began his public ministry. It's also the outward expression of our new inward faith. It's the declaration that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. Hi, this is Pastor Cedric. And if you would like to take this next step of obedience and make a public declaration of the finished work of Jesus Christ in your life, I would encourage you not to hesitate. As the Ethiopian eunuch said, here's water, what prevents me from being baptized? Today, here's water, what prevents you? Our Father, we thank you so much for the finished work of Jesus. 
We thank you, God, for the opportunity just to remember the finished work of Christ through communion. Uh, Lord, it is, I'm always amazed because as I look at that wafer, how uh, perfectly round that wafer may be, uh, it's not perfect enough. No matter how good that juice tastes, it's not good enough to, to really supplement for the blood of Jesus and the, the body of Christ that was beaten and broken and bruised beyond recognition on our behalf. But we thank you for the time to sit still, to remember what Christ has done for us uh, and how he loved us and reconciled us into himself and snatched us out of the grips of darkness and placed us in his marvelous light. So we thank you for this. We also thank you now for the privilege and the opportunity to proclaim this faith in Christ through public, a public declaration of baptism. And Lord, we look forward to those who have already uh, have signed up to be baptized. And we look forward to, if you move in anyone else's heart today, God, we are so honored uh, to celebrate this uh, with each other. So Spirit of God, please come and speak to me. Please remove any hindrances and barriers that I may have in my own heart in our hearts so your work can fall on good ground and bear much fruit in jesus name amen. amen in matthew chapter 3 verse 15 jesus said this about baptism for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness so think about this for a moment here's the king of kings the lord of lords the perfect one who says that John, I need to be baptized by you, and it is specifically to fulfill all righteousness, or it is the right thing to do. So if Christ is our perfect example, right, for us to follow after, to mimic our lives after, or to uh, align our hearts with his, and he says that this thing called baptism is that important, it then should be that important to us who say we follow him as his disciplined followers or his disciples. That being said, if something is so right, right, uh, it's so fulfilling to do, why then is it, for many of us, so difficult to do? Why is something so right, so difficult to do? And over the years, I've, I've come to realize how many times people make it so complex. And, and what I've done is accumulated some of the reasons why I've heard over the years why people don't want to be baptized. Here's the first. I don't need to be. I'm just good. The way I am, I don't need to do this. Secondly, I'm too sinful. In other words, something is, is wrong with me. I'm, I've done too much wrong, so I dare not get into that clean water, right? Uh, it's not the right time for me. Well, I was baptized as an infant, or it's too cold outside, believe it or not. It's too cold outside. I, I don't want to get baptized and be in the water and go outside in the cold. I'm afraid of water. And believe it or not, there were two people today who said that that fit their description, that they were afraid of water. But they overcame their fear to be obedient to the Lord. Here, here's a good one. I don't want to get my hair wet. You know, pastor, I just got my due done. You know, uh, <laughs> I spend a few dollars, right, you know, to get my hair done, and, and, and I just can't get it wet right now, right? I don't want to get my hair wet. Or, again, here's one, and I think this is probably the best one. Uh, I'm not ready, right? So, listen, truth be told, no one in this room today will ever, ever be ready for baptism, you know, no one will be ready and say, yeah, this is the perfect time for me to be baptized. So that being said, what I'd like to do is give you a few reasons why baptism is right and why is it so difficult for us to concede to it. So if you can open your Bibles, and it'll be on the screen today as well, Matthew chapter 3, we're going to begin there, verses 11 through 17, then we're going to skip to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter uh, 3, verses 11 through 17. It says this, Then Jesus arrived from Galilee to the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have the need to be baptized by you, and yet you are coming to me. Imagine yourself being John the Baptist there, right? Here's the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Lamb without spot or blemish is asking him to be baptized. 
Verse 15, it says, But Jesus answering said to him, Allow it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. Verse 16, After he was baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove, settling on him. And behold, a voice from the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am, what? Well pleased. Here's my son, here's my daughter today, in whom I am, what? Well pleased. So let me give you a few of these points right now out of this verse. You find in verses 11 through 14 this, that it teaches us, and also it takes humility to be baptized. One thing is for sure, listen to this. In verse 14, John tried to prevent him, but, but you know, he said, I have a need to be baptized by you. Think about the order and the rank of authority. Here's Jesus, here's John the Baptist. Jesus is reversing the order of, of authority. He says, no, there's this responsibility for me to submit to your authority. Remember what Jesus commanded us, his final words before ascending to heaven. He says, I want you to go and what? Make disciples, right, of all nations. Baptizing them was the first act of obedience. Baptizing them, right, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. And lo, I will be with you until the end of the age. It is almost like Jesus himself is saying, the instructions that I'm gonna give you on a later date before I leave this place, I'm modeling it right now. I'm modeling to you obedience. I'm modeling to you the first step of obedience, which is baptism. So again, think about this, that Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, suggested himself that it's time for me to be the lesser and you to be the greater. Whenever there's a discipleship relationship, there is the responsibility for the disciple lee the one who's being disciple, to, right, right, to submit to or follow the authority of someone. It's kind of like this. You get a new job, chances are you're going to have an onboarding process, hopefully. And chances are you're going to have someone who can teach you the ropes, hopefully, right? There's somebody that you'll be trained to by. There's somebody that you'll be reporting to. There's no different in the kingdom of God when you come to know Christ, it's important to follow authority, follow leadership so you can grow and you can begin to do the same, which is called discipleship. Humility. Always remember, it is the correct estimate of ourselves is that God knows everything. We know nothing. God can do all things. We can do nothing without him, right? God is all powerful. We have no power but what he assigns to us. So again, what this does immediately in all of our hearts, it teaches us and it says to us, for you to be baptized, it will always take humility. Humility, why is that important? It leads to our second point in verse 15, is that humility always leads to doing the right thing. If someone says today that, I want to come to know Jesus Christ and I'm immediately do the right thing without any speed bumps. I think we're probably all sadly mistaken, right? So there's this responsibility of what humility does. Humility allows you to submit to the one who is in greatest authority, who is Christ, who helps you do what? The right things all the time in an, or every circumstance. But think about this. If we cannot choose to do the right thing first, in a small group of people called the church where everybody in the church is trying to do the right thing. Chances are when we leave the church building, we're gonna to struggle to do the right thing. It's kind of like this. So many times we want God to help us. We want to do the great things for God before we do the small things. Baptism is like the small thing. You do the small thing and then you get the big things right. So it starts with humility, which leads to doing the right things. The word righteousness here means this. Listen, it means the conformity to a higher authority. It also means God's standard. Baptism says I'm aligning with God's standards. It also means just as one should be. So apply that for, for today. Baptism is saying today I am choosing to be just as I should be. Then you leave the building then you go home and then you have confrontations and difficulties between husband and wife and family issues. That principle, if choosing to be as I ought to be, 
continues in that context. You follow me? So you learn it almost like dress rehearsal by saying, I'm going to do what God is telling me to do and instructing me to do today so I can continue to do and to be just as I ought to be in every situation of my life. Proverbs 21 verse 3 says it this way. To do righteousness and justice is preferred by the Lord than sacrifice. In other words, you can do a lot of good things, charitable things, even sacred things, but at the end of the day, are you doing the right thing? Doing the right thing all the time is what pleases God. James 4 verse 17 says it this way as well. To the one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it to that person is sin. So there's a big theological word that is called progressive sanctification. What that simply means is, is, is that over time, God will sanctify you, right? Over time, you'll be set apart and you'll be, you'll, you'll be set apart further and further, the closer and closer you get to heaven. And when you die, go to be with him. Now you take off this imperfection, you put on what? Perfection in, in him. But what comes along with this sanctification is what is called progressive revelation. In other words, there are things that you don't know and we will never know on this side of heaven that is written in the Bible. No one knows the entire Bible but whom? God himself. So over time, he will progressively reveal things to you so you can pro progressively become sanctified. Right? So there are things when you come to know Christ that you just don't know. You can say this, God the Father won't hold, against, he won't hold it, that against his child. It's kind of like if you as a parent did not instruct your kids not to run out in the street when cars are coming or not to play in the street at all. When they play in the street for the first time, chances are you're going to give them a pass. And you're going to say, hey, sweetheart, hey, son, don't play in the street because cars will come and you can get hit by a car. Now, most good parents, if they see their child there a second or third time not doing what they're saying, there comes what? Consequences, right? And discipline that comes along with it, similar to God. If you do not know the right thing to do, why would God chastise ties you, on, uh, you know, with that? But as we progressively understand, there's this responsibility. Thus, baptism is this humility that says that we are who we should be today. So the more you hear about baptism, the more you come to baptism services, the more you see baptism services you know online on youtube and instagram and all these different places the more and more you become accountable to doing the right thing because now you know the right thing to do make sense so again humility leads to doing the right thing and doing the right thing you find in verses 16 to 17 it ultimately pleases god it pleases god obedience pleases God the word well pleased means this to take pleasure in or to approve of when we do what is right before God beginning with baptism it pleases God and God approves of it you're not doing it and getting in the water you're not being baptized because you want your parents approval you want your husband's approval right you want you know there be times that a husband and wife know that they should be baptized but husband will say, you know what, I'm doing it today. The wife said, I'm going to wait. It, it, it's not necessarily always, well, we're going to do it together, right? Because if God is saying it's your responsibility to do it, you do it when God tells you to do because it is what is pleasing to God, right? It's what, what is pleasing to God. So when you find, uh, when, when you hold on to this principle as it relates to, at the end of the day, my desire is to please God, I believe you see what 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, I think reveals more of. Listen to what it says that our, our, our ambition in life should be. Therefore, we also have as our ambition our, our aim or our love for honor, whether at home or, in, or absent. It says, all I want to do is to be pleasing to him. Our goal in life should be to please him. Because when we please him, guess what? what happens? You pretty much begin to please other people. You do what's right. You please God. 
It even says this. Listen to what it says in Proverbs 16, verse 7. When a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with them. So the beautiful promise that God gives you and I is this. If we do what is pleasing to God, he will even take care of your enemies. And last time I checked, uh, most of us may have an enemy some way. You may not even know you have an enemy, but chances are you have an enemy, right? And we all, if you've put your faith and trust in Christ, uh, there's one enemy who is called Satan, all right, who's behind a lot of things that people will do towards you. And I believe there's this wonderful promise is, is if you do what is right, God will deal with those who become your enemy. That's his promise. Our desire should be always to please him. Amen? Then if you skip to uh, Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 17, we won't read all those verses, but this is what I'd like you to hold on to. Think about this. Here's Jesus who's baptized, right? Uh, the Bible says he comes out of the water, the Holy Spirit descends upon him like a dove. So there was some visible, there was something, uh, some encounter that, that the Spirit of God had upon the life of Jesus. Now, it was interesting because if you continue to read it in, in that chapter and into chapter 4, it says that the Spirit of God then leads him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. One thing is for sure is when you're baptized today, there will always be temptations that will follow. You will have a wilderness-like experience, Right? There will be multiple temptations. As a matter of fact, uh, it is said that when Jesus was tempted, he was, had the same temptations that Adam and Eve had in the garden. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life. I want to please my flesh. Well, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Right? Lust of the eyes. He, he took him to the pinnacle and said, Jesus, you can have all this. Right? What's coupled with that is the pride of life, is that authority, authority, power, and prestige. There's those three temptations that will always come along with mankind here on this earth is I will lust to please my flesh, right? I will long for things that I see and want them. That's why we have marketing companies and right, commercials, you lust for after what you see and then you go out and you buy it and you want it, you take what doesn't belong to you or you can't afford, right? And fourthly, I, I want all of this because of me. I want to build a kingdom unto myself. It's all about me. It's all about my family. It's all about me, 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 and we lose sight of him in a dying world. And Jesus ultimately says that man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He eventually rebukes Satan and says, get behind me, Satan, right? And, but then this is then what begins to happen. After Jesus, okay, went through all of that with Satan, you look at verse 17 in Matthew chapter 4. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Somehow, some way, what baptism does is prepares your heart for the wilderness. Some way, somehow, there's this supernatural work that God will do in you to prepare you for anything that comes your way. And the wilderness, some strange way, prepares us for the work of God. The water prepares you for the wilderness. The wilderness prepares you for the work. One thing I can say personally in my life is that those things I've experienced in real life is what helps me navigate today, helps me navigate ministry, helps me navigate the responsibility to care for each other and care for other people. So again, the challenge you face today is this, is to know that when you are remaining faithful to God, you'll be prepared to do whatever supernatural work that he's called you to do, to turn this world upside down or right side up. 
He will help you reach friends and families and impact people that you would never, ever, ever can imagine before taking this first step of faith. Amen? Amen. Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. Let me read this. It kind of summarizes how he prepares you. It says, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceptions according to the traditions of men or according to the elementary principles of the world rather than according to Christ. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form and in him you have been made complete. You're complete. You're complete before you even go into the water because of Christ. And he is the head of all rule and authority. And in him, you were all circumcised, circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism. And so again, you go down to the watery grave, you come up new. In which you also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your transgressions and the circumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all of your transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile towards us. And he was taken and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. That's why you're ready. Because he's already paid the price. Amen? And that's why we always like to say when you baptize out as a child, some teach you baptize as a child so that because of your sins, you're covered and if you die, you go to heaven. Well, there's what is called an age of accountability. An infant doesn't know wrong from right there's a purity and an innocence that's in the child, right? So why then is there's this need, right, to say, well, we need to make sure you're baptized, but we also know that we're not saved from our sins through works. Baptism doesn't save you. It's the finished work of Jesus. Amen. Thus, the importance of baptism is timing, right? Timing is you come to know Jesus Christ, then you baptize. Because there's an outward expression of what you have, what the transformational work on the inside. You follow me? A baby can't identify with Christ, but a young child who understands, who have prayed themselves, a teenager, an adult who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, it, it's, it's like this, what has happened to me on the inside it is now to publicly declare. That's why I call it the, the marriage, or it's the wedding ring in the marriage. Uh, without this wedding ring, I'm still married to my wife going on 37 years. Still married. This wedding ring does nothing to the marriage. You follow me? But what it says is, look around, folks. When I have this ring on, it says to everyone else publicly that I'm what? That I belong to her and she belonged to me. That's the same thing with this the public declaration of wa being water baptized is you belong to him and he belongs to you. Amen. Make sense? It's an outward expression of your inward faith. Children can't, can't do that, meaning infants can't describe that, right? As you get older, you understand. You get older, you have greater understanding. You get older, you, get, you have greater understanding. You can communicate it you know what has happened to you on the inside and you're ready to express it on the outside. That's what we're doing today. Amen? Amen. I want to end with this, this wonderful, simple example of this. In early days of missions in Korea, it is said that somehow a couple of pages of the gospel of Jesus Christ were found their, find their way in remote mountainous areas. And what people used to do was take that portion of scripture and they would lock in on it and they will have Bible studies in homes and really their lives are transformed. But it was interesting because they will wait for other, like there has to be other people who can come and teach us more about this, right? Because remember, they only had pages. But they got to this place uh, called baptism. 
And they had this great debate about, well, how does baptism happen? Who should do baptism and all these different things? And they came to this radical but yet simple conclusion. They said after talking it over and praying and discussion, discussing this, they all went home, took a personal private bath in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, am I advocating that for you right now? No. But remember, too much is given, much is required. Today, we know the right thing to do. We know that baptism is an outward expression of our inward faith. We know that baptism is our first step of obedience. We know that there's something transformational that God would do in a heart and a life of a person. Amen? When they take this step of obedience and they proclaim to the world, right, that this is uh, who I love and this is who loves me. Amen? Amen? So let's pray. Today, as we bow our heads and close our eyes, you may be at a place in your life that you're not really sure if you're ready because you do not have a relationship with Jesus. In other words, that marriage hasn't taken place. So the wedding ring is premature. Today, if you want to put your faith and trust in Jesus, if today that you uh, want to acknowledge that Jesus Christ came to die for you, he was buried for you, and he rose again, if today you want to live with Christ in heaven, if today you die, do you really, really know where you're going? Is it heaven or is it hell? The latter alternative is, is for those who choose not to surrender their lives to Christ. But today, if you want to surrender your life to Christ, I would like to lead you in a simple, short prayer. Some call it the prayer of salvation. Some call it the sinner's prayer. But really, it's just simply saying words like this. Jesus, forgive me that I'm a sinner. Forgive me that I've chosen to live my life apart from you up until this point. Jesus, come and cleanse me of my sins. Come into my heart to live forever. Transform me through the power of your Holy Spirit. And just a simple prayer like that would accomplish the work that Jesus set forth for you, in you, before the foundations of this world. It's, if this is what you want, as we, all of our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if there's anybody who say, hey, Pastor, I'd like to pray with you. Can you just show me your hands, if you don't mind? I'd like to pray with you. Good. Just pray this simple prayer. Just say, Today, Jesus, I understand that I am a sinner. But I also now realize that you came to die for me, Jesus. Would you please wash me clean by the power of your blood? As today, I, I ask you to come into my heart as my Lord and my Savior to rule and to reign my life. Please strengthen me to live for you through the power of your Holy Spirit all the days of my life until I see you face to face. In Jesus' name, amen. So why is something so right so hard to do? Something so right so hard to do. In other words, it is so right and it is the right thing to do to be baptized as a follower of Jesus Christ. But yet for so many, there's this big struggle. There's this mountainous decision or we make it very mountainous uh, to do. Uh, but yet it is very practical. It's a very simple decision. Here's a, a few reasons over the years I've kind of noted why some people struggle with being baptized. One is I don't need to be. I'm just good like I am. I know Jesus. I don't need to do anything else. Secondly, I'm too simple. Some people think that I'm just not ready. 
spiritually, you know, I got sin in my life and uh, or maybe I'm still struggling with something over and over again. So I'm not quite ready. Uh, some may say it's not the right time. Some also may say that I was baptized as an infant and that was good enough. Uh, some others may say that it's too cold outside. But then there's other people who says they're afraid of water. Believe it or not, they're afraid of water so they won't be baptized. Uh, others say that I don't want to get my hair wet. And, and lastly, again, there's just some people say I'm just not ready for it. Just not ready. One of the unspoken responsibilities are the unspoken challenges in the life of a follower of Jesus Christ is humility. In other words, the journey starts with humility. The journey ends with humility. Let me say it this way. When you come to know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, it takes humility to realize you need a Savior. Am I willing to submit to a higher authority? You put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Guess what your life is going to be for the rest of your life? Submitting to a higher authority. In other words, being baptized is simply said, this is God's standard. It's, it's his standard. This is what he says we should do. But then the last definition of righteousness, you know what I mean? Just as one ought to be. Help me to live in a way that is honoring to you in every situation. Help me to be as I ought to be as I honor my parents. Help me to be as I ought to be as I raise my children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. Help me to be as I ought to be towards my wife, even if she's not respecting me. Help me to be as I ought to be towards my husband, even if he's not loving me as Christ loved the church. Help me to be as I ought to be, even when I'm being treated unjustly. Help me to be as I ought to be. That's the theme of a follower of Jesus Christ's life. That's the theme of righteousness, doing what's right. So it's just like God to say, hey, listen, you're on the team now. If you want to be on this team, you got to be willing to be identified with me. You got to put on the team jersey. And that's what baptism is all about. Baptism is like you're on the team now. Put on the team jersey. Go public that you're on the team jersey, right? This wedding ring does not say in my heart that I'm married to my wife. But it tells everybody else around me that I'm married to my wife. And it should tell me every time I look back and remember the ring it should take me back to the moment that I met her, that I fell in love with her, that I committed my life to her. Same thing with baptism. I don't want to be baptized to please my mom or my dad. I just want to please Jesus. Because you cannot continue a kingdom work. We cannot continue a kingdom work without humility, doing the right thing, and pleasing God. Thank you for joining us here at Commitment Online, a place for all nations. If you're ever in the Philadelphia, Delaware, or South Jersey region, we hope to see you in person. But for now, please tune in next week here at Commitment Online.